The Department of Land and Natural Resources has posted videos recorded at an August informational meeting in Javi about the North Kohala Agricultural Water Study. State Senator Lorraine Anoy joined DLNR representatives at the Kohala Village Hub for the public gathering. The consulting firm Waimea Water Services LLC is conducting the study on agricultural water users, demands, and agricultural water system conditions in the region. Funds for the study were appropriated by the Hawaii State Legislature with the support of Senator Inouye. The North Kohala Agricultural Water Study. Uh, multiple agencies working together. Probably the first and most important question, next slide, why another study? Um, everyone's heard about studies before, a great many have been done, lots of research of the water in this area. But of course, things have changed and time have changed. First of all, and probably the biggest impetus of course, is the Senator is responding to problems and requests for help in this region. People have asked for help, we're trying to kind of find a way to help everyone. Second, of course, previous studies are based on large agricultural models. We all know about the plantation, but if you look at some of the studies that were done later in the 70s and even the early 80s, they were all based on the ditch and they were also based on either single or a couple very large users of water. The reality is, is we don't have that today. And as such, we really need to redevelop how we're going to put this together in order to deliver water at a reasonable cost at the, uh, the volumes necessary to take care of agriculture that's out there today. Also, there, oh, I'm not done yet. <laughs> I'm just making sure I follow the list. Um, major land and water use priorities have changed. This is a very big one as well. Back when the ditch was dug, they were basically, and if you look at the most of the studies, it's how to divert all of the water coming off the mountains into the ditch and flow it down the ditch. Today, that's not the only priority. Stream, in stream uh, flows are important, uh, natural environment, there's a whole bunch that ties together that we have to balance. So again, this, these are all the reasons we're looking at another study. Regulatory issues need to be addressed, specifically things like uh, diversion, per diversion permits, easements, you know, where we put the pipelines in, how we get it. A lot of the pipelines, the old pipelines, don't even have full easements for where they lay. The ability to work on those and fund them and of course put any money in them for a reasonable period of time becomes very difficult in that case. Changes in Kohala from single lag large agriculture, which we've talked about, and of course Senator Noy, which we cannot, we will not be doing this without, managed to secure the 1.5 million to figure this out because there's a lot that we've got to dig through. There's so much data and we have to find, kind of figure our way out to get to the end and come up with a plan. Now the next slide. Water in Hawaii. We can't go too far without talking about some of this. What, this of course is the constitutional article. I'm not going to read it to you. But in a nutshell, it puts all of the natural resources in Hawaii into trust for everybody of Hawaii. Next slide. What does held in trust mean? Fundamentally, we, the water belongs to everybody. No one person owns it, no one person controls it, no entity controls it. We control it collectively. Now, that being said, it is managed by the Commission on Water Resource Management and there are priorities assigned both for cultural and natural benefits. All the water belongs to all of us collectively and no one buys or sells it. You know, people say, oh, I'm buying water. Technically, you're not. Normally speaking, you're actually buying the transmission or the use of the water as it's passing through and heading on down to the ocean. Because in the end, that's where it all goes. The rain falls in the land, goes back into the ocean, cycles back through. And last of all, there's no direct cost for the use of water. Transmission, distribution, and a big part of it is responsible use. One of the elements is if large amounts of water are wasted or diverted to a negative impact, that of course is something that can become an issue for the state which will bring further regulation. Next slide. The purpose. The purpose of the North Kohala Agricultural Water Study, and I'm gonna read this one to you, is to identify demands, resources, and transmission requirements needed for agriculture to thrive as plantation era infrastructure reaches the end of its useful lifespan. The plantation has been gone since the 70s. It's 2017. The residual equipment that we've been living on and mining the, the value out of over the last decades is reaching the end of its service life. Many of it, much of it's way beyond its service life, and we're still continuing to use it. As it finishes, it's, there's the ability, coming back to like the easements, to service, rebuild, reuse. We're not going to necessarily have that ability, so we have to have a plan going forward. This is not limited to technical issues, because we have a lot of those covered, but again, it comes back to the regulatory, and of course, all the legal requirements for users, operators, and ownership of pipelines, things of that nature. Next slide. Participation guidelines. And this is a really big one. This is not compulsory. Nobody has to talk to Dave or I. Nobody has to give us any information they don't want to, other than what's already required by the state. We can't force anybody to do anything. This is about all of us trying to work together to come up with a plan that we can all live with and work with going forward. 
The goal is mutual beneficial collaboration. We've got to find a way to work together. Plantation area infrastructure and its, its sources. We kind of need to talk about this just so we have a, a frame of reference. A couple things about it. Koala sugar went through a long evolution before it finished, it finished as koala sugar and wound up at the size it was. It started as small plantations and even before that it was just general agriculture. It was consolidated, slowly grew up, and then in, of course we saw it in its final form and then unfortunately due to uh, economic changes, it shut down. Because of that, a lot of these things were left over. Um, next slide. Historic sources. And this tells you the scale of what we're talking about. A lot of folks talk about the, the volume of water that was used and available. They talk in hundreds of thousands of gallons or a million here and there. If you look over, these are all the sources right up in here that were used to consolidate into the total water used. This is in the, uh, the natural flow that occurred up in there. And this totaled, if you look at it, 141.7 million gallons of water a day. That's the water that was flowing up in the regions they were collecting. And some of it's over in this area and it does include groundwater. All right, that's what was available. What was actually, actually used was a lot less, but about 45.7 million gallons a day. We don't use 45 million gallons a day for water in Kohala anymore, not even close. And that's what the infrastructure was initially built around. And lastly, Developable, this would be what they could reasonably recover if they built everything out. Now, some of this included things like Alvini and some other sections that have been abandoned for a very long time. But this just kind of gives you a scale of what was going on out in that region. Now, tied to that is the amount of infrastructure that a single large landowner could actually put in. Next slide. This shows you the, the, what was actually existing. And these maps are available on the back tables as well if you want to take a closer look at them. But, of course, we recognize North Kohala. This right here is the Kohala ditch, all right? This right here is the Kahana ditch, and then it continues up. There's a series of reservoirs, there's also power generation stations, there's pump stations, but all of those red lines are the pipelines. This was map was set in 1955, but all of this has been added to and removed, of course, over time. But you can see just how big the infrastructure actually was in this region. Next slide. Summary of the legacy systems. Very large amounts of water are available. Kohala has lots of water. The question, of course, is, and we also did figure out how to move it around. Transmission is possible. They were moving over 45 million gallons a day on average. Very, very large amounts of water was reaching out to this area. Agricultural productivity dramatically improved by irrigation, especially once we get past Javi, because, of course, it dries out as it goes around the corner, and that's where uh, irrigation becomes more and more critical for agriculture. The challenges. And we talked about this briefly. The infrastructure is very, very old. Not just the ditch itself. The ditch in itself is actually in pretty decent shape. We can thank, of course, Bill Chantel for that, keeping it alive. Yeah, the guy looking around and pretending not to him. There you go. Because I'll be honest, if it wasn't for a lot of Bill's hard work and frankly hard nose and willing to keep the, you know, his face to the grindstone, this ditch probably wouldn't be here today. He's done a lot of work to get us this far and that has to be recognized going forward. This ditch is not an easy thing to manage. And the fact that it works as well as it does today takes, you know, you have to give the credit where credit is due. A lot of work's gone into it. So thank you, Bill. Tied to that though, <laughs> tied to that though, the legal use of the system is not entirely certain, all right? And what that means, water allotments by sea worm, we don't have all of the documentation in place because, again, this was done before any of the modern laws were passed and it was running. Is it grandfathered? Well, that, that's what we need to explore and discuss. Also, incomplete documentation. A lot, unfortunately, when the plantations closed, um, if you weren't around for as much of that, they had rooms bigger than this full of nothing but data and information and maps that had all sorts of, of just untold amounts of natural history information and all the legal information regarding how these systems were put in. A great many of them were discarded. And what that's done is left large holes in how the whole system's put together. So we have to go back and see what we can either reconstruct or what needs to be re regenerated so in order to have the system be sound to allow further investment in it. Land ownership is no longer contiguous. And this is a very large one. Everybody's got to work together. Again, people have to allow a pipeline across their property. People have to be willing to cross somebody else's property to get to water. It's not the days of we're putting a pipeline here. We all got to sit down and talk about it and come with a, a, a means to do it. And then, of course, an organization to ensure that the, the burdens and expenses are shared fairly and to keep that thing running in a long-term situation. Demand is not, oh, not done yet. Just back up. And the demand is not large enough to justify the system that we have today. And that right there is probably the crux of this. There's not enough water used in agriculture in Kohala to justify building something like the ditch. Now it exists, 
But is that going to be the, the actual end-all, be-all to this solution? It may, it may not. One of the things to remember is when you talk about an inch of rain over one acre of land, that is 27,154 gallons, all right? And you say, well, that's a lot of water, and it is. But when you start talking about the ability to cover an acre of land, and you have 40 inches of rain, you're talking about a million gallons a year that can be collected just on one parcel if you can store it. So there's different ways to approach this based on what's actually needed on smaller scale agriculture throughout the islands. We don't know what the, the answer is yet, all right? We need to look at the overall picture. Uh, next slide. The elements that we're looking at. Agricultural demand, fairly self-explanatory, but probably one of the hardest ones to nail down. We need to figure out what's really going on now, what people are consuming, what they, you know, they, they think they're consuming, and what they're actually consuming. But the harder one, of course, is what's projected. What do we need down the road? Agriculture, and especially larger water systems, have lifespans of 30 to 50 years, not three to five. So unless we have a clearer picture that we can start building towards, it becomes very difficult to plan properly and be able to manage that. Sources, we're going to cover that in just a second. Um, transmission, the elements we're looking at are pipelines, reservoirs, and the Kohala Ditch. Now, the reason Kohala Ditch is by itself, we're going to talk about in just a second. And then other, which I'll cover as well. Next slide. Agricultural demand, working with the Department of Agriculture for current and forecast needs. Been working with Scott and he's been helpful with that. Also going to be working with the County of Contact and R&D, Department of Ag. Um, kind of looking for what the official numbers look like, but a huge part of this is finding out what the input is from the actual community. What are people doing down here? What do you think you're going to be doing? Does anybody see anything in the future? Um, you know, we have things going on with dairy, but is there other stuff happening? We need to kind of see if there's any visions or movements of that that we can actually start planning towards. Next slide, please. Sources. Unfortunately, this map's a little bit difficult to see. Um, again, it's sitting on the back. But what you have here is the sources of water that are available on this island. This map shows rainfall, which of course determines your crops, your irrigation demand, your suitability for catchment. Now, starting over here, you have up to 140 inches of rain. And we all kind of know this. And as you work your way down off into this region, you get down to as little as nine. And what that does, it dramatically changes what's available and what's going to be needed in these regions. But just as importantly, you see all of the little white dots that are a little tough to see in this map right now? Those are wells or springs. There's that many in this region that are registered. We don't even know what's not registered. And we're not even talking about diversion yet. This is strictly what flows out of the mountainsides or can be drilled towards. And more importantly, is representative sample of the actual groundwater that's available. Now Dave is actually more of the hydrologist than I am. He's a geologist by training. And so we've been working in these tunnels and we've done several wells down here and be able to give you a little bit, you know, we need to look more into that in order to find out what we can actually do. I will tell you, there are some resources down here that are pretty amazing. If you get out in the old mill site, there's the shaft down in the valley there. That shaft did have salt come into it when they were pumping it at full capacity, all right? It's only a couple hundred yards from the shore and when they ran it at full, full power, they got up to two or 3,000 chlorides, which isn't drinkable anymore, but it's still usable for some irrigation. But you got to realize they were pumping it at over 7,000 gallons a minute, all right? That's how big that resource was. So there's a lot more here that we can work with. We just got to figure out what the actual tools are that can be made available. Also, when it comes to the springs, and we talked about the existing wells, springs, all the sources need to be evaluated for a few things. First one is their just general condition. And especially when it comes to things like shafts and tunnels, anywhere a human could be involved, there's safety. Because a lot of these tunnels, they're a little questionable when you look at them. And there's few that Dave and I, first thing we do is we decide whether or not it's safe to go in. And if it's questionable, we're not going in. We're not gonna, this is, you know, nobody's worth dying over getting to a small spring. Um, and then of course, water quantity and quality. How much is coming out and what kind of quality are we looking at? Most of this spring water is actually very good. Um, it's also important to note that some of those springs no longer function. When the Kahena ditch was dropped, um, it undoubtedly affected some of the groundwater because a lot of the water flows laterally through the strata of rock out here, which we can get into a lot more detail. But bottom line is that the water's not flowing quite the same as it was. So they need to be reevaluated in that context. Now, right at the bottom, see right over here? Sources on private property will only be evaluated with the owner's permission. We're not going to come bullying in anywhere. If somebody doesn't want to talk to us or doesn't want to show us anything, we're, we're just going to say thank you and have a good day. And it's, it's not, again, we have to choose to work together. We can't force people to work together. Next slide, please. Transmission. We are going to look at the existing pipelines, conditions, and legal statuses. I'm 
pretty sure what they are, but again, we have to look at them up, look them up, see what's actually out there, because a lot of stuff's not on the maps and things were put in. We'll look at them as time goes by. Their legal status is a big one. We've already run into several issues where some of these pipelines don't have easements or ways of moving water around, or uh, the, the lawful means of being there. And without that, of course, investment and all becomes very difficult. Legal requirements for new pipelines, and this comes down to both organization as well as just the legal blocks. Organizations, if you know, it, we've done work with potable water systems, and they have to do something called a capacity report. And that actually has nothing to do with how much water it produces. It has to do with its financial viability in the long term so that nobody gets stuck with a, an orphan system that nobody can afford to maintain or upgrade. We're gonna to have to look at something of that nature. Basically, we're gonna want input from the, the users to develop some sort of, of structure so that we know that if a pipeline's put in, it'll be maintained for an extended period of time. DOT, uh, legal organization, multiple users, and DOT road crossings. This is a big one. If you look at our sources and where we need it, there's a road in the way. And if you've ever tried to get a pipe across the road, it's a tough one. Next one is the Koala Ditch, which we'll talk about, and then the reservoirs. If you look on the maps, you'll see a large number of reservoirs, most of which are inactive, and the laws have changed dramatically. But some of them may be suitable or not, but again, we're going to be reviewing those. Next slide, please. The Koala Ditch. Most of us know about it, but there are a few things that just need to be said for the record. First and foremost, the Koala Ditch is privately owned. It's not a government agency, and then because of that, it doesn't operate under the same rules. It is not a utility. It doesn't have the restrictions of utilities on it, and also it's a means of transmission. The Kohala Ditch doesn't make water for you. It gets water for you. Currently, the source is in Honokani, and the reason I say currently is there have been other sources that have fed it historically, but they're not feeding it right now. But the current source is in Honokani, which is owned by Kamehameha Schools. It does not sell water. It sells the transmission of water, and because of that, you know, that's where, that's where the costs and values come in. And as I've said before, from what we've seen, it's been, been the fact that it's running at all, it means it's been run really well. Next slide, please. The other, and this is what the forms back there are for, and we will talk to anybody at any time. The official information needs to flow through One World, One Water, because we want a real solid record in case anybody has any questions, but we'll talk to anybody at any time. But the reality is, what does the community want studied? Is there something that needs to be looked into that we don't know about? I don't pretend to know everything down here. I know quite a bit about Kohala. Dave and I, like I said, have worked a lot down here. But there's a, so much out there that are doing on small scales or bigger scales that we're just not, no one's told us yet. If there's something the community wants us to look at, we need to know. Next slide. Initial input will come from One World, One Water, and she'll give you more information on that. Next slide. And this is huge. Kohala's been here before. You know, we've talked about the evolutions and all that. But Kohala has thrived for a very, very long time. There have been people here more than during the plantation. It started with basically people just living here, growing what they needed, and living off of it. Over time, it became farms and small plantations, then it became bigger plantations. The ditch really is what tied all the plantations together, and then eventually it became Kohala sugar. The economic shift in Kohala sugar went away, but of course, people are still here. All the resources are around. Everything we've always used here to thrive is still in existence and present. The key is we have to figure out how to work together in order to make it available.